Good afternoon and welcome to the Hertfordshire Fire Pension Board. My name is Theresa Baker. I'm the Democratic Services Officer to the Board um, and I'll be starting the meeting off because the first item on the agenda is the annual election of the Chairman of the Board. First, I have to make an announcement about the procedures during the Board. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, the Council will be holding this meeting electronically in accordance with the relevant regulations. Members of the public may also attend this meeting in an electronic capacity, and there is a link on the Council's website for them to do so. Members of the Board are asked to keep their microphones switched off until called to speak, and to switch their microphones off once they have finished speaking. Cameras may be left on throughout the meeting if members wish. If you experience connection or other technical issues, it may help to switch your camera off. Cameras should be switched on if and when speaking in the meeting. To indicate a wish to speak, members should use the raise hand function. Use of the meeting chat function is exclusively for voting. At the end of the debate on each item of business, there will be a vote. Members should vote using the meeting chat function by indicating for, against or abstain. The chairman will declare the result after each vote. Breaks of at least 15 minutes will be held every two hours and will be taken after a speaker in the debate has finished speaking. If the board are voting, the vote will be concluded before the break is taken. Other breaks will be incorporated as appropriate. So now I'm going to go on and ask the members of the board to introduce themselves, including the position they hold on the board. So to start off, can I ask um, Terry Hone to introduce himself, please? Councillor Terry Hone, a portfolio holder, a cabinet member for Community Safety and Waste Management, Hearts County Council, and for the next uh, five minutes, chairman of this board. OK, um, next I'll ask Jill Goodchild to introduce herself, please. Good afternoon, Jill Goodchild, Head of Specialist Services for Community Protection and Employer Rep for this board. Darren Scotchford, if you could introduce yourself, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, Darren Scotchford, Station Commander, Operational Training and uh, Employee Rep for the Board and currently Vice Chair. Okay, and finally, Stuart Joyner, if you could introduce yourself, please. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Stuart Joyner from Harvardshire Fire and Rescue. I'm a Fire Protection Officer and I'm a Member Representative. Okay. So just to advise you, there are no membership changes or substitutions today. Um, we do have apologies from Steve Tant and Daniel Cooper. So the board's chairman and vice chairman are elected annually and the side of the board um, from which they are elected rotates annually between the two sides of the board as well. In today's meeting, the chairman will be elected from the member representatives and the vice chairman will be elected from the employers um, representatives. So, as mentioned earlier, the first item on the agenda is the annual election of the chairman. In accordance with the constitution, um, I will ask for a nomination from the member um, side of the board for a member representative uh, to become chairman of the board for this year. So, could I have a nomination, please, for the from for the um, a member from the member side of the board, please? Yes, I'm happy to nominate uh, Terry Home for the role of chair. He is the chairman at the moment. Sorry, apologies. Uh, something I, else. I had my hand up. Uh, you asked us to put a hand up. Who's to speak, by the way? My apologies, Terry. If you could speak, please. Yes, my hand is up. I am going to uh, nominate Darren to be chairman of the uh, uh, the um, board for the next coming year. Okay. And if I could have somebody to second that nomination, please. Yeah, I'm happy to second that nomination. Thank you. Thank you. So that Stuart Joyner has seconded the nomination. So, Darren, you're now the chairman for the next year. I'll hand the meeting over to you. Thank, thanks, Theresa. Um, yes, a little bit of confusion on my part there. Apologies, got ahead of myself. Um, so it, it now calls on, uh, on myself to ask for a nomination for vice chair um, of the, the board for the coming year. Yes, Jill. Could I nominate Terry Home for Vice Chair? 
Yes, thank you. Noted that uh, Terry has been uh, nominated. Uh, do we have a seconder for that nomination? Well, yes, Stuart. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I'm happy to second that nomination also. Thank you very much. So now, Terry is now nominated as uh, the vice chair for the coming year. Um, the next item is um, relates to uh, declarations of interest. And um, can I ask members to declare any financial or pecuniary interest related to specific matters on the agenda? Uh, clearly, some of us are pension members, but that, uh, for the purposes of this, is uh, it doesn't matter. Yes, Terry. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Before we start the uh, meeting, uh, can it, I, I'm led to believe that full council this week, Arts County Council, uh, declared that there will be some changes in the administration of both the Hearts Pension Fund and also of uh, our pension fund. Uh, some changes in the administration. Perhaps before we go down uh, and start on item number four, perhaps, uh, uh, I don't know, Patrick, or uh, can enlighten us as to those changes. Yes, thank you, Terry. Um, so there was a report that went to County Council earlier this um, week on Tuesday, which was about the future administration of the delivery of this service, both to the local government pension scheme members and to the fire scheme members. The pensions committee has overall responsibility for both the fire and LGPS schemes. I support that uh, committee in addition to both the LGPS and fire boards. The um, current provider is um, the LPP. We have a commercial contract with them, which will end in um, March next year. We have been looking at um, the actual market for provision of this service over the last two years. And we came to the conclusion after looking at the commercial option, i.e. going for a procurement process, delivering this uh, service in-house and going for a partnership model that um, we would um, look to continue our relationship with the LPP, but for a partnership model as opposed to a commercial arrangement. So what this will uh, mean for members, and this, sorry, this was subsequently approved by um, County Council on Tuesday that we enter into a partnership with the LPP. But what this means for members of the uh, both the fire scheme and the LGPS schemes is that you're, there's a continuity of service that um, the impacts on members will be uh, minimal um, in that data of uh, personal data of those members will not be transferred from one provider to another. So that limits data corruption and uh, what you will see going forward from the partnership is probably um, will be enhanced service delivery um, in the form of there's been a new website launched. This board will receive a lot more detailed reports and, you, and uh, today's report is an example of that. There is a lot more data and management analytic tools which will give us some more granularity as to um, times um, um, in responding to member phone calls, um, replies to emails, and uh, it'll also give you some demographics around the scheme membership, who signed up to um, sort, of, um, sort of online service and stuff like that. So the main message to get out to you is that uh, the pensions committee um, that represents uh, the, both schemes made a recommendation to council that we um, enter into a partnership with the LPP and council approved that on Tuesday. And that's all I was going to say, but we'll take questions from members of the board if you have any. Thanks, Patrick. Are there any questions for any members of the board? Yes, Jill, I can see you've got your hand up there. Uh, Patrick, can you just give me a broad outline what the difference between a partnership model and a commercial model is? Yes, of course. So a commercial um, model is that you pay a management fee um, as per a, a normal sort of uh, contract that you would have with an external provider. And uh, those management fees could be increased each year dependent on a factor such as inflation. A partnership arrangement is different in that we are delegating the function that Hertfordshire County Council um, administer the fund to another local authority and this uh, local authority is Lancashire County Council which is a joint shareholder with London Pension Fund Authority of the company that is called LPP. 
So as a partner, um, a budget will be set by LPP and we will pay a budget contribution to uh, that um, partnership. So essentially, we're going from a commercial arrangement to a delegation of function. We are delegating the function, the delivery of this service through um, Lancashire County Council, who will deliver it through the LPP entity. Thanks, Patrick. Are there any, any other questions uh, on Patrick's short report there for us before we, we move on? I'm seeing a few shaking heads, so I'll, I'll, I will move on then. Thank you. Um, so just moving on to uh, item three on the agenda that we've got to uh, uh, confirm the minutes of the last meeting, which was held almost a year ago, actually, to the day, um, the 19th of December, if we can remember that far back. Um, is everyone happy that the uh, minutes provided are a correct uh, record of that? Uh, and we need to uh, vote in the chat for that, please. Thank you, everyone. So um, four votes for there. So ev everyone agrees that they are a correct uh, record of the uh, last meeting. Um, next item on the agenda, item four. Can I call on uh, Tony Sorkins to uh, present the LPP quarter two report for 2020, 2021? Good afternoon, everybody. Right, these, this is the new report, um, the first one that we've actually presented to board. Uh, so if, bear with me as I go through this. Would you like me to share the screen or do you all have a copy in front of you? I do have a copy, but I think there's a few nods there, Tony. So if you would share it, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I have a copy on my screen as well, but uh... Yep, sharing doesn't harm. OK, are you seeing the annual plan in front of you? Yes, we are, Tony. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Just make sure that's worked before I carry on. OK, back to the beginning so I know where I'm going from. Just to run through the new quarterly report uh, that we are going to provide now. Um, this would just give you a bit more detail behind the administration that we are providing. The first lot of figures for the um, annual plan shows that we've met all our statutory deadlines um, that we, we have uh, up to this point in the year and that we are due to meet everything for going forward. This shows your breakdown of fund membership current age demographic that we have on the system and how we are performing regarding casework against the service level agreements. It shows your quarterly performance and what casework we've got on the system ongoing at the end of the reporting quarter. So what we've carried over from one quarter to the next. We've showed elapsed times here, so you can see how long the cases are sitting either with um, across all the quarters with regards to uh, how long it's taken to actually complete the cases. And elapsed times for things like deferred into payments, so we can make sure that we get the um, pensioners out their, their money as soon as we can. And active into payments, so this is <clears throat> Sorry, paying our active firefighters that are retiring within a good time scale. We try to set ourselves a, um, a time scale of getting at least 50% of all retirements paid within 30 days. So that means 30, within 30 days from retiring, we'll get their first pension payment. Uh, this doesn't include getting the lump sum payments. They're normally paid earlier than the 30 days. And again, the percentage of retirements paid 30 days within retirement date. This is for the lump sum payment. As I said, that comes up normally way before the 50%, so way before the 30 days. 
and deferred into payment. Now, this is usually where we need to locate people where we haven't got the current details or we're going backwards and forwards with retirement forms. We'd like to get 50% of them paid. It's not a contractual target, but we, that's what we're aiming for. So we are looking to improve ways of um, making sure we've got the contact details for our deferred members so that we can get contact them well before the payment due date. And we managed to pay deferred into payment lump sums within 30 days. We got that directly to the member within that time frame. Now this is for our help desk. So we're showing here the wait times that people are average on average waiting for a call to be picked up. Before uh, June, we could only show across the entire business from July onwards, these figures are client specific, so they're just for people that um, said that they were ringing on with regards to their Hertfordshire firefighters pension. And the resolution rate, this is the amount of um, queries that are resolved directly at the call centre without having to pass through to the team. So we try to get as many of them uh, resolved at first contact as possible. So we don't have to delay information going to the member. And the same with emails, rather than the email being passed down to the actual firefighters team for response, if it's a query that the uh, call centre can provide the answer to, they do so straight away rather than it come down to us so that the member gets a reply quicker. And the satisfaction rates for the call centre that we have here from July, again, they are client specific and those that answered the um, survey at the end of the call rated us quite high with regards to the call centre. Customer satisfaction for retirements came back at 100% across the board. And this is for your pension online, the members registered and shows the amount that you've got registered and against the active deferred and pensioner members <clears throat> with regards to numbers and percentages. And it's the age demographic of those members that are registered. And certain service improvements that we're looking at, these are the ones that have been delivered and the ones that we are looking at in the future. So we've got um, the launch of a single website for all members. That's on its way if it's not been um, put out already. I think it has. Uh, we've got various things that we're looking at launching and these things are all in the works. So as and when we're able to update on those that we will do in future reports. We're looking to update as much member contact data as possible to get the email addresses and telephone numbers for our members so it's easier to get hold of them. And in order to get death grant nominations on file, we've started to collate how many we've actually got already on the system and our call centre are working to get um, more death grant nominations on file. E-communications opt out. We would like to use more e-communications, so we do give the members an option, obviously, to opt out of that if they prefer anything in the post. Engagement. So the engagement team has been working on various engagement activities over the last quarter. We're trying to um, get more and more engagement, obviously, bits and pieces are happening. We're going to cover McLeod in the uh, technical update for you. And data quality. So we, we tell you what percentage of our data that we hold is correct on the system. What is the accuracy rate for conditional and common data? And these are for the TPR reports that you will get every now and again from TPR. And that's the end of that um, the actual report there. If there's any questions, anything you want me to go over or get more detail sent um, at a later date, if I can't answer you now, then please do let me know. Thanks, Tony. Uh, there are a couple of hands up. I think we had Stuart uh, first and then Terry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Hi, Tony. Stuart Joyner speaking. 
Um, I wanted to just roll back to one of your slides, which spoke about call handling times. Mm -hmm. When the information came through to us from the pension board pack this month, and it, it, funny enough, it sort of coincided with the information coming through on the new pension, I decided to have a look and subsequently make a phone call because I've been looking through your slides. Um, I'm guessing a lot of the call handlers are working remotely at the moment through COVID, is that fair yes. to say? Yeah, we're, we're totally, I believe, totally at okay. home still. We're, we're yeah, total remote um, working. That makes sense. My ex my experience on this occasion was, and I haven't haven't called the, the line for a while, was I was second in the queue, which sounded fantastic, but it still took 10 minutes to connect me to a call handler. Um, so it didn't seem like a busy time, but it did take me a while to come through, which made me think if I was, you know, if I'd came through as being 15th or 20th or even 30th in the queue, it could have been a long time. I thought it was appropriate to bring that to your attention because it, it, it's a little bit out of kilter with what's produced in, in the document there and just wondered if you had an idea why that might be the case. This document goes up to the end of September 2020. Mm -hmm. So if it does so happen that there was heavy call volume as at the point that you called, obviously that's going to take effect. And yeah. um, but <clears throat> excuse me, but that is something that I can refer back up to the call centre manager for them to check if at that date, if you want to let me know the date and time that you called. If there was heavy traffic or less people on, then that's something we can take into account for you. Thank you, Tony. I, I appreciate that. So I just wanted to hear if you're aware you had particular peak, uh, issues in peak times because it did seem, having been through the survey, it did seem it was a, a little bit at odds with your documents. But I, I accept what you're saying that it could be uh, the time I called was outside outside of that graph. But uh, yeah, it was slightly more than seemed to be indicated. But thank you for your response. Thank you, Stuart Terry. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, Tony, I, I think the report is uh, tremendous. I mean, the level of detail we've got in there is far, far superior to what we've had in the past. And and, and it does uh, give us the opportunity to to have detailed uh, knowledge of what is going on. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, some of the issues which uh, uh, Stuart wrote one, which was of concern. But um, overall, it seems as though, yeah, even in, in spite of what's happening in the world today, you seem to be coping quite well. Um, thoughts on that, Tony? You know, how, what's the impact of, of COVID on how your, your ability to meet the needs of the firefighters that uh, uh, have pensions or are looking to have pensions? Well, at the moment, we have been working remotely. My team, that is the only one I can really, uh, <laughs> really talk about, but my team's been working remotely since March and we've managed to keep um, above our SLAs for all of the case levels across all of our clients. So um, we can meet the, the needs of the firefighters. Uh, we have direct links into the call center if somebody calls and requests that an actual um, administrator that deals with their pension calls them back, then that is either passed directly down to us or a callback case is put on to be run back within 48 hours and we can schedule all that in so that we can get back to the members as soon as possible if they need to speak to somebody with a bit more technical background to the actual firefighters pension scheme. Thank you. One, one file if I may, uh, Chairman. Um, emails, email addresses of firefighters, you're just over 50% I think I saw on there. Um, what are you doing to get more email addresses? Because in this day and age, um, it seems to be the, the method of communicate, the preferred method of communication, as far as you are concerned. Um, but uh, are we? Uh, what steps are we taking to get more email addresses from our firefighters? At the moment, it's a case of if somebody contacts us, we take or ask the question straight away: Is there an email address that we can put on file? And we make sure all that is updated and up to date. And um, there will probably be. It's discussions that we need to have and because of the contractual things that were going on in the background um, if you are able to give us email addresses to upload into the system then great then we can we can get that sorted out um, but it's steps in progress we know that we need to collate more email addresses the more that we've got on the system the better and it's a working together in progress you know in order to get that updated with more and more as time goes on OK, thank you for that. I shall have some more questions when we go back to your report as well. But uh, on, on the data, as I said, vast improvement, a lot more info, which is very helpful. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Terry. I absolutely agree. Having looked through the, the level of granular detail that this this report does bore down into is is, is really uh, really impressive. And I, I just thinking, I don't know, Jill, whether there's something um, that can be done because I, I noted the same thing uh, as Terry had noted around the uh, the email uh, contacts and being able to keep hold of uh, people's uh, email address. I don't know if there's anything that perhaps we can be look at, looked at from a, a service perspective in a general memo or something like that. Um. Darren, just to answer you on that, obviously you may be aware that all firefighters now have Hertfordshire County Council email addresses. Um, so we, we can look at that, but we still, as you'll also be aware, don't necessarily have enough ease of access for our firefighters. But again, that is something we are looking at long term. So certainly we could um, speak with the LPP and, and share those business emails. But I think we'd have to wait till we're at a position that we were confident that people were able to access those easily if it was key messages being shared. But it, it, it is an ongoing project. No, thank you. Thanks, Jill. You're right. And, 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 and as you say, it's actually very often it's hardware that I think is the issue rather than the email addresses. But yeah, something we need to, I think we'd be all be very keen to improve um, in terms of that communication. Neil, did you, did you have a question? You had your hand up a little while ago. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. I, I just I thought that I, I, I might be able to add something to uh, the point that uh, uh, the points that Stuart and Terry had raised and that Tony had uh, uh, had dealt with. Um, one of the things that I think has been put in place, and this is connected with the remote uh, remote working and the, and the way the help desk are working, they they are, they have tried to um, channel the queries through uh, uh, members of the help desk who have got specific uh, uh, what's called blue light. Um, uh, uh, abilities to help to try to maximise the number of uh, queries that are being able to answered at, at, at you know uh, uh, by the first uh, the first responder if you like so long, bad term terminology but uh, 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 you know so that that uh, uh, that that might tie in a little bit with what Stuart was uh, finding that uh, you know, if it was if it was a relatively small number of people who were actually handling the uh, the blue light uh, queries that might be why it was it took a longer a longer thing to get through. Um, and and uh, uh, you know, I think that that ties in a little bit with what Terry was saying. I, I think it is quite, uh, it's, it's been quite encouraging that uh, we've been able to move to this ability to everybody be working uh, and uh, communicating uh, all across the country. I mean, as I say, uh, you know, in some ways, COVID has almost almost helped. Uh, you know, uh, be, uh, the difference between being Lancashire and London has has, has actually shrunk because it's we're all working down a, a, a down a, a down a screen rather than um, uh, uh, you know people who are based you know ge geographically in the same area. But um, uh, I thought that might be might be useful. No, thank you, Neil. It, it was. Uh, I, I do have a question, and I think this probably talks to the same issue. I, I noted the difference between the uh, resolution rates for emails and calls. Uh, and I wonder if that's because of the level of detail that's included in the email questions as opposed to the call questions, because there is there is a little difference there. I don't know if you could help us with that, Tony. We do find that if somebody just wants a, a quick answer, how do I get an estimate? How do I change my address? That kind of thing, then they tend to ring. But if they've got a big query that they find it easier a lot of these times it's easier to explain it in writing than it is to go through it again and again and again and again on the phone that they then tend to put it in email and if it's that kind of query that's the kind of query that comes down to us therefore a case gets put on for us and therefore the resolution rate at the call center isn't as high so that i'm um, everyone's nodding at me that i can see on the screen so it's nice that you understand that that's that's where i think that's coming from no, thank you. I don't, I don't know. If, are there any other questions? I don't know, Terry. You said you might have some further questions on the report. Uh, you're on mute, Terry. Yeah, we come back to the report itself rather than the detail. Um, I look at the report itself, if I may, and uh, let me get my screen up. Going. We decided to do drastic things. Yeah, there's been a few uh, changes. Uh, age discrimination case, and um, there's been a few. I think that's that that has a resolution, didn't I see just recently? That the a uh, the age discrimination case hasn't come come up with an answer on that. No, 
Yeah. And we yeah. wish. <laughs> and I, the, the only step forward that's happened is that the consultation has closed. All the consultation reports um, and from all around the country for all of the public sector schemes have gone to the HMT, Neil, help me here. I, I was going to say, uh, uh, Tony, I think it's, it's possibly worth stepping backwards a little bit for that. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, Terry, you're right that, you know, uh, as far as, uh, you know, we're going back uh, over a year that, you know, uh, you know the, 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 the approach to the fact that there, uh, you know, there, there, has, there, was, uh, there was a successful uh, case against the uh, introduction of the care scheme and that remedy is being introduced. Uh, the point that Tony is point, uh, making is that um, while we had the um, a, a consultation, because this affects doesn't just affect the uh, fire scheme, this affects all of the public sector schemes that were introduced uh, in 2015. Uh, that that consultation, the Treasury consultation, uh, were uh, closed in October, um, and the next stage in that will be. We would expect to see amendments to the public sector, the wider public sector pensions act, which which has overriding uh, control the, the, w w uh, on all of the public sector schemes. So the NHS scheme, the civil service scheme, the uh, uh, the teacher scheme, and of course the fire scheme. And then once that comes out, that's expected in spring 21. Uh, uh, we would then expect the draft legislation for the fire specific scheme to come out in autumn 21 with a view to having remedy uh, for spring 22. The big question, for, uh, uh, and this is uh, um, for myself and Tony, but obviously it most definitely affects all the firefighters, is whether the remedy, which will cover the, the period, potentially the period from 2015 up until 2022, whether that will be handled as an uh, uh, what's called immediate, which is uh, within a year, probably of 20, uh, 22, um, or a deferred, um, deferred underpin uh, arrangement whereby a decision will need to be made at retirement. Um, so that is the big decision that we're waiting for and we expect to get a, a steer on that early in the year, uh, early in the new year. Thank you for that. So what triggered it was, I got a, uh, uh, something comes through from, uh, yeah, the uh, fire rescue pension boards that, uh, there's a joint statement on age discrimination, which came out on the 4th of December, which really reflects exactly what you just said. Um, yeah. Now that the board is aware of that situation, which was important. The other thing that was coming up was a standard wording for inclusion on CTVs in divorce cases and others. Yeah. Would you, somebody like to comment on that? You're on mute. No. Yeah. yeah I was say, Tony, did you want to take the, uh, uh, that one or do you want me to, to pick it up? Uh, um, yeah. The, uh, um, okay. The, uh, uh, yes. Uh, the, the, there's been a, a national agreement to, to come up with uh, some some wording on on the uh, uh, the uh, divorce, uh, particularly on the divorce factors. It's because the fact some of the factors changed with effect from the first of November. I think that was uh, what that was particularly related to uh, regarding uh, the treatment of guaranteed minimum pension. The reality is that probably doesn't affect an awful lot of the divorces that are going through because it's it's all it's all dealing with service that was built up before ninety seven. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um O'Brien versus Matthews. Any update on that? Um uh, yeah, well I, I can give a uh, I, I can give a bit of a recap of what that will uh, what the O'Brien Matthews case is, because I think there's a danger that it's it's as time has slipped on, you know, it, it, with, with everything else that is going on, it, it, it has almost slipped on the back, uh, the back burner. Um, you may remember that uh, uh, retained, uh, retained firefighters were given the opportunity to join the pension scheme and backdate to uh, April 2000. Um, crikey, that was, that's going back now. 2000, uh, 2010, Tony? Is that what yeah, I was saying? We did the exercise in 2015, I believe 15. it was oh, finished. Was later. Yeah, uh, finished, finished. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, as, there was an appeal from a part-time judge who was, uh, who was also uh, who was covered on, on the uh, similar arrangement where part-time judges were allowed to build it, uh, uh, to join the uh, Judiciary Pension Scheme. Which allowed and they've won their case and have been allowed to backdate membership of the uh, 
uh, judiciary scheme back to 1978. And that has uh, we've been given instruction that that will be extended and will affect uh, retained firefighters. We are still waiting for quite a lot of detail as to whether it is going to reopen the door for all retained firefighters who have got service between 1978 and, 19, and 2000, or whether it is just that the people uh, that those who took out the took the retained exercise and brought back to 2000 are going to give the, be given a fresh opportunity to backdate further. Um, the concern and, the, and what we've been working with with the LGA is that. Um, in the real world, uh, uh, you know, trying to uh, expecting employers and payroll sections to have details of hours worked and uh, um, uh, it, 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 hours and, and the rate of pay before 2000 is um, extremely ambitious. Uh, so, so um, what we're we're working with nationally is to come up with an agreed average. Uh, Average salary and average hours for people who would be in that at that position, and so the, all that we would need from an FRA would be details of the date they know the person started working. We would then be contacting the members that are involved and saying that we're building it around this model that we would have to work. And if they think that they worked longer hours or on higher pay, that it would be putting the emphasis. On the, to the individual to to come up with something that that is practical. We think that is the the only sensible way of trying to deal with things that are going back. Uh, when we go, you're going back to 1978, you're, you're talking about bits of paper in um, in in somebody's garage, probably rather than <laughs> rather 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 than uh, even looking at computer records. Let alone the fact that it's very likely that we're talking about four or five uh, versions of payroll systems uh, going back. Uh, uh, from that, but that's that is what the uh, that is what the uh, um, the O'Brien Matthews case is. We haven't got a time frame we're working to. The cynic in myself and Tony assumes that all of this will hit at the same time, so we'll have the whole McLeod remedy and and uh, O'Brien and Matthews will all happen at the same time and all be given very short time frames for us to turn it round. Um, but uh, I've worked with Tony for a long time uh, and. Uh, I, I know that uh, 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 miracles might not be impossible, but they just take a little bit of while, a little, little bit of time for us to get there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Neil. Uh, yeah, really uh, comprehensive update, and uh, I can see Jill's looking at that and thinking there's a fair bit of work to do there, Jill, uh, if and when that uh, that comes uh, comes your way to, to deal with. But yeah, thank you, Neil. It's a really good update. Are there are there any other questions or, on that report? Any any other comments or questions at all? No, I, I don't think we're asked to do anything other than note the contents of that report. And I will reiterate that it is a fantastic report. Uh, thank you very much, Tony. I think the uh, the level of detail, as we've already said, and uh, and, and also some of the uh, the scheduled improvements as well um, that are going to be we're going to be looking at in the future. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I will feed that back. It is um, obviously the first time that's been presented to board, so it's good to know it's well received. If anyone has any thoughts about anything that might be included or shouldn't be there or anything like that, then please do feed back to us. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, Item five is to just to bring to your attention the date of the next two meetings, uh, the 8th of March 2021, 10 o'clock in the morning and the 16th of July 2021. Um, that's it. Any other part one business? Is there any other business that anyone wishes to raise? I just thank you for organising it in this way. I know it was issues really because of delays and we had to have two I mean, within a year etc cetera, etc cetera, in 12 months and we've just about done that so well done Teresa for getting us where we are uh, and not uh, being in breach of some regulation somewhere which I know <laughs> took effort but now we, we know what we're doing and how we're doing it and we know who's in place that's very helpful because we can do it this way as you say we don't have to call people to come in from all over the country and sit in, uh, in Hartford to do it we can call them from all over the world and sit on a, a screen so please feel free uh, Neil, Tony, if you want to go off to somewhere exotic and you're quarantined, you can still participate. 
Thank you, Terry. Um, all that remains for me to say then, unless uh, anyone else has got anything, which I don't think they have, is uh, have a, uh, a safe and, uh, and good Christmas. And uh, we'll see you all in the new year in March for the, for the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Thank you.